Today, you are going to get a special front row seat to the memorable Springbok career of 1995 World Cup winner Gavin Johnson. And because it's our 50th episode, we had to have a 95 World Cup champion. Gavin, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Gavin, before you and I begin our conversation, let's take a look at this week's trivia question. Name the team that ended the Springboks' record run of 17 consecutive test wins in 1998. Now, if you know the answer to the question, you can put it in the comment section down below. We'll also find out if Gavin knows the answer, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Gavin, I want to begin our chat in 1993. Talk to me about how you were feeling ahead of your test debut against Argentina. It was a wonderful memory um, because I'd been over in England with... Um, the South African Barbarians team, and um, which we did very well in, actually. We won all eight of our games uh, in England, and um, we had one game to go, and um, uh, our team manager uh, called me in the hotel and said, Gavin, congratulations, you've been called up to join the box in Argentina. So I, I actually didn't start that tour. Um, I only joined it... Uh, later on, there was, uh, I think, one uh, midweek game to go um, at a place called Rosario. And then um, I played in the third test. And um, it was, <laughs> I suppose, quite surreal when you, um, when, you know, you don't, it doesn't, the realization of actually going to play for the box now uh, doesn't quite hit you until afterwards. Um, but yeah, what a what a very special time in my life, and what a great privilege. And um, yeah, the the thought of uh, going to play my first uh, test for the box is just uh, absolutely amazing. And you scored twenty two points in that match as well. We won quite handsomely. What a way to announce yourself! We actually played really well in that game. Um, it was uh, yeah very special. I managed to. Uh, score a, a very nice try in that game. Uh, the team played well. Um, the uh, as a team, uh, we managed to move the ball around nicely. So there was actually some very nice open running rugby, uh, which I really enjoy. Um, that's uh, um, so uh, the ball moved out nicely to the backs. Uh, the, uh, uh, interplay with the forwards and the backs was amazing. And um, there were some wonderful opportunities created in the backs. And um, yeah, so it was a, a very nice game, actually. We scored lots of tries and, and uh, I managed to yeah, score 22 points in the, in the first game. That was amazing, yeah. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, why not hit the like button? Gavin, I remember watching you in the Curry Cup that year, 1993, and you were actually excellent for Transvaal, if I may say so. What were your hopes at that stage? Well, it was amazing to have um, hit the, the provincial uh, rugby scene, um, getting into the A side, because I'd come from Pretoria. Uh, I'd uh, played for Harlequins for five years and uh, managed to get into the Northerns B team. And then in um, 1992, I left Harlequins and started playing for Pirates in Johannesburg. And um, I, I was invited uh, to the Transvaal squad uh, training and, and that year uh, played in the, in the, the Transvaal B team. And, uh, and then in 93, um, when Kitch Christie... Uh, started coaching Transvaal. Um, he invited me to the Transvaal uh, squad training, and uh, that's how it, uh, it it was a build up from there. Um, it was actually interesting. I'd injured my shoulder very badly uh, in '92, and uh, had quite a major shoulder operation, and even had thoughts of not even playing again. And uh, and then at the start of the 93 season, early in January, when everyone started training again, um, Kitch Christie got hold of me and said, Gavin, we want you to come to uh, the Transvaal squad training. And I said, well, coach, you know, I'm not even sure that I'm going to be able to play because I'm, my shoulder's in a sling right now. 
and uh, I'm wondering if I should even carry on with the game. And he said, well, why don't you just, you know, come and uh, uh, just start running with a, with a team and, uh, well, with a squad and, uh, and let's see how it goes. We'll, we'll slowly, you know, work on your shoulder. We'll start bumping the, the tackle bag slowly and um, use shoulder pads and so on just to, to uh, get your confidence going again. And uh, so it was a bit of a process. Um, and so, but then what happened was amazing. My, my shoulder recovered very well and, uh, I became part of the, the squad and then there was, um, uh, opportunity to start, uh, playing in the A side because, uh, some of our, some of the Springboks in our team, um, were away doing Springbok duty and that opened the door for me to get into the A side. And um, so that was the first time that I actually started playing, you know, provincial rugby in the being in the A team, which was uh, fantastic and a very interesting story, actually. Um, my very first game, a Curry Cup game for Transvaal, uh, was at Ellis Park, and the game was against um, the Free State. And um, I'd been p- picked at fullback. And uh, a guy by the name of Cameron Oliver, I'm sure rugby, the rugby guys in the rugby world will remember Cameron. He was an amazing fly off, uh, a very good rugby player. And him and a, a scrum off called Steph Nell, um, they were the, the scrum off and fly off that were picked for this game on the Saturday. And um, they went off to Sun City on the Friday. And very sadly, got killed in a mo- uh, in a motor car accident that day, the very day before the game. And um, I think it was that evening, Kitch Christie phoned me and said, "Gavin, we've had this disaster, and um, we're moving you from fullback to fly off uh, for tomorrow's game." Yeah, so that that was just out of the blue, and uh, so that's how. Um, I played probably my first 10 or so games for Transvaal um, at Flahoff. Gavin, we spoke about your memorable debut against Argentina in Buenos Aires. So after that, into 1994, the first two tests against England, as well as the first two tests against the All Blacks, and I know that you went on that tour to New Zealand, but you missed those four test matches. How disappointing was that? It was disappointing because 93... Um, was a, an amazing year for me, uh, getting into the Transvaal team and the, the Transvaal team did so well. Um, and so, you know, getting injured so that I couldn't go on the, on those tours, um, was very disappointing, but I'm grateful because, um, my, my Nika started wearing this, uh, knee bra- had a, f- first of all, had an operation, started wearing this big blue knee brace and um, started playing again and uh, got fit and, and re- re- uh, match fit again. And then amazingly, I got the, the call up to join the, the team in New Zealand. Um, and that was amazing. It was yeah, just uh, amazing grace that I got the call up and the opportunity. And um, and so when I got there, there was one one test to go. Um, there was one midweek game to go, and uh, which was against um, Bay of Plenty, and then the third test at Eden Park. And so I played in those two games, and um, that's how yeah, that's how I got to you know be be back in the team. It was just opportunity, huh? I've had quite a few former Springboks on the show that told me that that New Zealand tour was the toughest one that they had ever been on. But given that you were only there for a short period of time, I'd be very interested to hear how you experienced New Zealand. Well, we'd been over to New Zealand um, lots uh, for years because of the, you know, the, um, the started off as Super 10, which became Super 12. And, and so we were going over to Australia and New Zealand to play often. Um, so we had an idea of what it was like to play in New Zealand, but, um, to be playing against the All Blacks, 
for me arriving right at the end of that tour, Sheepers, it was a significant moment in my life and uh, in my rugby career to to end up uh, playing against the All Blacks um, was the ultimate for me. I only ever played uh, one game against the All Blacks because um, I played, in total, I only played seven tests for South Africa and maybe about 20 tour games. Um, so that was, you know, obviously really a, a very special day for me. And um, standing um, in front of those All Blacks, all Blacks and um, watching them do the haka was uh, a real moment for me. It actually it took me back to my my, my youth when uh, I was actually, you know, watching watching this haka. It was like uh, I went back into the lounge of the home that I grew up in uh, with my mom and dad and my brothers, and it was as if. I was watching this game on TV back in the lounge back home, you know. And um, so it was a very weird uh, sort of feeling and moment to be uh, watching the All Blacks live right in front of me. Um, but, yeah, it, it was great. And we ended up drawing that test match. A lot of people say that we really should have won that day. What do you say? A couple of things. Uh, there was, a, there was a, a kick early on in the game. Um, a penalty kick that I should have got. Um, but I, I must admit that um, the nerves got to me on that kick. Um, uh, but, yeah, we actually played really well in that game. And um, we we gave away one or two penalties as well that we shouldn't have. There were a couple of... Uh, one particular uh, naughty boy in our team who had a bit of a scuffle with uh, Sean Fitzpatrick that uh, shouldn't have happened and gave a penalty away. Um, but overall, we played really well. And, um, yeah, we, we drew the game. But I would say that that was a game we, we could have won and actually should have won. You played on the wing in that test match. Remember, you made your debut at fullback. And we referenced the Curry Cup in 1993, where I said you were excellent playing at fly half for Transvaal. Given your versatility, I'd be very interested to hear what was your favorite position? Yeah, fullback was definitely my favorite position. Uh, I, got, I got picked on the wing, I would say, probably because my goal kicking um, became quite, port uh, quite important. And... Um, I did have I did have uh, quite good speed. My pace was okay, but um, it was never um, it was never that extra yard of pace that a a real fast winger would have. Um, my my speed as a rugby player was okay, um, but it wasn't the speed of a winger. And so when I played wing, um, it was a little challenging for me. Um, because I never felt that I, I had that extra yard of pace. And um, uh, I preferred playing fullback because um, I was m more comfortable there because that was my natural position and uh, I enjoyed um, the anticipation of the game uh, from the position of fullback. So, yeah, playing, playing wing in that game was challenging. I played a guy, uh, against a guy called John Timu. Uh, he was a very good player, very quick and very nippy, and you had to really watch him. Um, so, yeah, I coped playing wing, but uh, it was never, never my favourite position. After that New Zealand tour, Ian McIntosh was sacked as coach. What was your opinion of him as a coach? I really enjoyed Ian McIntosh, and um, I'm, I'm actually really sorry that uh, that he did get sacked because... I loved his passion. I loved the way that um, he got involved in our training sessions. He he was, um, you know, technically he was he was very good, and he was very hands on in uh, in the training, and um, he he created a, a wonderful atmosphere of excitement for us to, um, you know, play together and and be a real team and uh, installed that um, real sense of belief that we were 
absolutely able to win because he was just so passionate about the game and and was so positive about us as players that uh, we were able to always win and um, and and be amazing on the field. So uh, Ian McIntosh to me was just a, a wonderful bloke. Uh, absolutely loved his enthusiasm for the game. And uh, yeah, he'll always be a special memory to us. Very sad that he's uh, recently passed away. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I think, I stand corrected, but I think that I may have actually done the last interview with Ian McIntosh uh, on this channel. Uh, and I'll actually put a link up here for people who'd like to go and watch that video. Gavin, Ian McIntosh sacked. Ke uh, Kitch Christie came in to replace him. You're in the test match uh, for the first one in charge uh, under Kitch at fullback against Argentina. But then you missed the second test. You went on the tour to the UK at the end of 1994, but you didn't play in any of the test matches. How disappointing was that? It's always disappointing not to be in the team, you know, just to be on the uh, uh, on the bench. But um, you know, that's uh, that's how it is. If uh, if there's a guy who's on form and uh, and playing better and makes the team, you know, you you just got to respect that. And and that's just how it was. But always very disappointing to sit on the bench that was uh <laughs> it was horrible but um yeah that's that's how it is eh? and then in 1995 before the rugby world cup began we played a warm-up test match against western samoa as they were still called in those days at ellis park we gave them a hiding you scored a hat trick of tries uh, playing at fullback how confident were you at that stage that you were going to be the starting fullback at the world cup i think as uh, as uh, as a player you you're always up for it you absolutely believe that uh you can play and uh there's no reason why you shouldn't be in the team and at that stage uh i was playing well that that game against western samoa was an amazing game we uh, we had a, you know basically the full world cup team of of 95 so it was great to be playing in a very good team and we played well on that night and it was amazing that I uh, got the opportunity to score, you know, three tries. And so that's another very special uh, game in my life that I remember. Um, yeah, so I was, I was playing well, but sadly, as you know, in that game, I ended up um, picking up an injury. And um, right at the, at the, towards the end of the game, um, it was actually a try that I scored, um, the third try, and um, got injured there. And that actually did, did have a bit of an effect on me after that. Gavin, I've heard conflicting stories about this, so you can correct me if, if I'm wrong. My understanding is that for that World Cup, Kitch had a green team and a gold team. The, the idea being that the green team would play in the biggest matches. The gold team played against Romania and Canada in the pool stage, for example. You played against the Romanians. I'd like to hear from you because we did struggle to actually overcome them. But just in terms of yourself, your own personal point of view, how difficult is it playing against a team like Romania and Canada when you know that you're unlikely to feature in the bigger matches? Yeah, it's an interesting thing to talk about um, because it's true that um, when you're playing a weaker team that uh, you don't get as uh, excited about it, I suppose. I think it's a, a psychological thing that is actually very difficult to overcome. Um, you know, when, you, when you're playing... Uh, the the big teams and um, it's just so much easier to to naturally um, be more excited and worked up for it. Your the adrenaline is uh, just flows a lot better, and um, you know that you've got to you've got to get up for it. You've got to be right on top of your game. Whereas uh, just naturally psychologically, when you're playing a, a weaker team, it just seems to be. No matter how you try to tell yourself, you must just play as you normally do, as if you're playing the greatest team in the world. Um, sheepers. Sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. And actually, we played badly against Romania. Oh, it was horrible. And uh, we played badly as a team. I played badly as an individual. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't a great day at all. Gavin? 
The floor is yours. Describe the Battle of Butte Rasmus. That was... <laughs> it was... Um, uh, uh, yes, it, was, it was a hectic game because um, there was all sorts of aggression that uh, broke out. Um, uh, James Dalton, yeah, he's... He got into such trouble, and uh, and uh, Peter Hendricks, unfortunately, Jeep is a great pity that um, he was uh, put out on that uh, because of that game. It was, uh, you know, an obvious obvious tactic from Canada that they were going to come out and be very, very aggressive. And um, you know, the Springboks uh, have always risen to the occasion when someone. Uh, takes them on physically and uh, even when it comes to a bit of aggression and a bit of boxing uh, the guys don't stand back and um, and so it ended up becoming a very feisty game and um, yeah I'm just grateful in the end even after all the drama with the lights and and all of that going out um that we managed to pull the game off. And yeah, sadly, I got concussed in that game. Um, I, I was playing wing in that game. And um, yeah, I got taken out properly and uh, and I picked up a bit of concussion in that game. It wasn't too bad though, because I was able to, you know, stay on and, and, and play in the next game. I think it was against Western Samoa uh, after that. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a very tough game, but we we rose to the occasion as as the box side. As you say, Western Samoa were next in the quarterfinals. You played in that match. Andre Hubert actually got injured uh, quite badly. It was his hand. Uh, I think it was Mike Umanger who had who had tackled him quite ferociously. Um, I'd be interested to hear, Gavin. Did you think at that stage that there was a chance that you might be called upon for the semi final? Yeah. Yes and no. You know. Um, they they immediately um, uh, worked on sorting Andre out, you know. So I think we kind of knew that they were that they were doing all that they could to um, to make sure that he could play. And you know, Andre was in absolute top form um, at that stage in in that World Cup. He was he was absolutely amazing and really on the day and for the occasion he was the man for the job um because of his uh his form at the time and so it was it was very good and and the right thing you know that they did all all that was possible to get his hand sorted out and to make sure that he could play um you know you do obviously i did wonder what was going to happen uh if if it would be a possibility but um, you know, it, it didn't work out that way, and and that's okay. And I'm quite happy actually that uh, you know that he was he was okay to play. That said, how disappointed were you not to play in the World Cup final? It's horrible. <laughs> um, being on the bench is uh, horrible for me. It was always it was it was just really not nice. You you wanted to be. In the starting team, you wanted to be on the field, and um, you know <clears throat> when you when you're at that stage where you've been, you know, picked for your country, and um, you've been fine tuned, and uh, you you um, conditioned to play the game. You're fit and you're strong, and you're up for it. So you you've always got that belief that you you. You could absolutely be on the field, and you you could be playing, and so sitting on the bench is just like losing out on the on the action. Nevertheless, what does it feel like when the referee blows the final whistle and you are a rugby world champion? That is it is amazing because you know I was able to be part of an amazing uh, team, an amazing occasion. Um, it was a privilege. So I, I, so I played three of the games in the in the '95 World Cup, and then I was on the bench uh, for the game against Australia and um, uh, the French, and then the final against the All Blacks. You know, I was uh, I was on the on the bench. Um, it's interesting that I I never came onto the field as a reserve in those three games. 
which is quite amazing, actually. And uh, But, you know, very interestingly, um, the way it worked out in the end that I played ex exactly seven test matches for South Africa is actually quite significant because um, it turns out that <clears throat> because I've become a, a radical believer in Christ. Okay, I'm a I'm a I'm very serious about Christianity, and uh, I believe that the Lord showed me in so many amazing ways using the number seven, um, how He'd answered various prayers in my life and and done amazing things for me in life. And so, at the end of my my rugby career, you know, I end up with exactly seven test matches for South Africa. And so if I'd gone on from the bench, if I'd gone on just for a minute in any one of those games, the Australia game, the uh, the French game, or the, the All Black game in the final, uh, it would have given me an extra test match, okay? And uh, that would have taken me off this number seven. And, um, and uh, so... So, like I'm saying, you know, the Lord really revealed to me later on that um, my prayers, my hopes and dreams and the desires of my heart to play rugby for South Africa, he absolutely answered them with exactly seven test matches. Oh, that's a wonderful story, Gavin. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, we spoke a little bit earlier about your versatility as a player, fly half, wing, fullback. Do you think that perhaps, especially in those days, that it almost worked against you in the sense that a coach typically didn't know what to do with you? Yeah, I suppose in a way it did actually work against me. Um, I love playing fly half right through uh, my school days and um, my, my two years of national service when I when I played for the Air Force and um, and then my early days of club rugby and so on, uh, I always played fly half and really enjoyed it. I, I loved being in that position to be able to direct the game, uh, you know, be it uh, a, a kick or a, or time to run and pass or whatever it was, you know, being. Being the general at number 10, I, I loved uh, dictating the game from there. And uh, I had the, had the skills for it. Um, but as, as time went on, I started realizing that um, I was probably a little tall and a little bit lanky uh, to, to be at number 10. And so physically, I think uh, fullback was, was probably the better position for me. And, uh, and so when I was moved there, um, I was actually a little grumpy at first. It happened when I was playing for Harlequins and the coach for the first time. Uh, I remember when I was moved from fly half to fullback, you know, I thought, no, nah, cheapest, I've been downgraded yeah, and I, I was very upset about it. But it was absolutely the right thing to do. And as time went on, I realized that that was the position for me. So I ended up really enjoying playing fullback. Um, I think um, one of the reasons why I probably got to play on the wing a few times is because um, our coaches probably felt that I had enough pace um, and I had the, the, the rugby skills and so on. Um, but my, the kicking, the goal kicking became quite a factor because um, it turns out that, that my goal kicking... Um, was was uh, pretty good. Uh, my 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 percentage uh, percentage success rate was uh, pretty good, and I think that became a factor um, that I was able to be the goal kicker in the team if uh, if I could play on the wing, you know. So I I agree with you. I think it shot shot me in the foot a little bit uh, the fact that I that I was fairly versatile. So who was your toughest opponent? I remember once playing a, a game at wing directly against Jonah Lomu. Uh, it was uh, a Super 12 game at Ellis Park, and uh, it was horrible. <laughs> I, uh, I had to make sure that, that he, he never got any momentum because, you know, as we all know, when he picked up momentum, he was a very difficult man to stop. And especially when you were facing him uh, head on, you know. And so 
my my decision was that um, whenever the ball came to him, that as he got the ball, that I was going to be on to him so that he, he could never pick up any momentum. And so it took all the fun out of my game. I, all I had to do was concentrate on making sure that I was on him as he got the ball and never got to play my own game. So it was a horrible game. And he's a, <laughs> he, was a, he was a massive man. And, uh, yeah, I suppose a, a privilege to have played against uh, a legend like that. But, yeah, just the, f the, the sheer size of the man and an uh, arm, the, the arm like a baobab tree, you know, and, uh, and legs, my goodness. Yeah, he was really a big, strong man and fast. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that was probably the most difficult. Eh? Gavin, is there a particularly funny moment that you can share with us from your time with the Springboks? Yeah, there was one time, um, a, a very funny, uh, yeah, I suppose if I think back now, when we were traveling on the bus, there were often, you know, stories that the guys started, um, you know, sharing. And one of the stories was so funny. I was sitting behind uh, James Dalton and, um, and Hannah Stradom. And they started talking about developing shampoo that would uh, be able to make their hair grow. Okay, and if you know James Dalton, he's really a very funny guy. And, uh, and he loves telling stories and uh, he's got a wild imagination. And so he came up with the most descriptive uh, stories of how him and Hannes were going to use this shampoo and how they were going to grow their hair long and what they were going to look like and what they were going to get up to. It was absolutely hilarious. And they, they had the, the, the whole bus in stitches of laughter. And so there were times like that when the guys uh, came up with really funny stories when we were traveling on the bus that uh, are wonderful memories. I could just imagine. Gavin, uh, let me ask you, is there a player, a current player, who you particularly admire? I think Andre Pollard is... Um, uh, an amazing player for me. Yeah, I uh, his uh, his skill has uh, been amazing. His ball skills, running, passing, uh, his uh, his defence is amazing. Um, he's he's really got uh, BMT. I mean, if you look at um, the games that he's played in and what he's achieved, and when you look carefully at. Uh, moments in in the various games that he's played where he really had to come through and and step up and uh and mostly he has done it and uh so i i particularly think that andre pollard is a an amazing player and what are you up to these days uh these days i'm a farmer um when i stopped playing rugby i went and built a a tourism lodge on the banks of the Zambezi in uh, in Western Zambia, and I did tourism there for for twenty years um, with my wife, and we've got three daughters. Our three daughters uh, grew up there, and uh, it was really amazing the the fun of of building this amazing safari camp in a in a very beautiful in, environment, and uh, creating a, a little business out of nothing in the middle of nowhere and um and then i enjoyed the hospitality side of it uh you know people coming in to spend their holidays with us and uh coming to enjoy the zambezi and and the fishing and the birding and and the walks on the banks of the river there is absolutely amazing um and so i really enjoyed that for a long time but then about four years ago uh, my dad asked me to come and take over our family farm here on the Sokmansburg Mountains um, overlooking uh, Louis Trichard. And uh, so I, I actually went back to my roots because I, I grew up on a farm. And, um, and so now I've ended up uh, back on a farm and I really enjoy it. I love, I've had the privilege of living uh, in the outdoors uh, for most of my life. It was only during my rugby career that I was in the city in Pretoria and Joburg and then my last two years for Saracens in London 
uh, before I retired in, in 99. Uh, but then from there, I was straight back to the bush. And even while I was playing rugby, uh, when I met my wife, Penny, I uh, just expressed how important it was that she understands that we weren't going to live in the city, that we were going to head off uh, into the bush somewhere. And uh, unfortunately, she was happy with that. And uh, actually, we had made an amazing life in Zambia. And she's just been uh, a champion in, in my life. And I'm very grateful for that. So um, I lived in this amazing environment in, um, in Western Zambia. And, uh, and now I live on this beautiful farm on the, on the Soapbunsberg. Um, and so I, I get to enjoy this beautiful environment every day. Uh, we do uh, macadamia farming here. And uh, we're about to get stuck into quite an extensive uh, cattle project here. But um, so I live quite an active uh, lifestyle. I, I don't sit in an office at all. Uh, I'm out there on the farm every day. And um, what's nice in coming back from Zambia, I'm able to uh, spend more time with my family now, my dad and my brothers. Uh, I'll see them more often and their families. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying living on this farm here on the mountain. Sounds very enjoyable. Gavin, let's take a look again at the trivia question. Name the team that ended the Springboks' record run of 17 consecutive test wins in 1998. Do you know the answer, Gavin? Jeepers, I, I think it was England. And you would be exactly right. 100%. Gavin, congratulations. Well done. You have got the right answer. Yeah, Shane. It was a great pity that actually. Yeah. Yeah, great pity. Ah, they, were, they were going so well. It would have been great to have won an 18th one, but, you know, such is life, as they say. Gavin, let me say, it was lovely having you on Front Row Rugby today. An absolute pleasure. And I hope that we can have you on again in the future. Wonderful. Thanks, Peter. I've enjoyed the chat. Thank you very much. Last time on Front Row Rugby, I had former Tri-Nations champion Franku Smith on the show. You can go and watch that video. It's appearing on your screen right now. Next time, I'll have former Springbok captain Gary Teichman here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, why not spear tackle the like button? You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from Front Row Rugby. See you next time.